Praise God. So this month we are going to look at the passion of Christ. We are going to look at uh, different aspects on uh, why Jesus died for us. Hallelujah. Uh, so f- come with me in this series. Uh, today we are going to start with the importance of Jesus' death. Hallelujah. Then in the coming series we are going to look at why was the resurrection so important. And then we'll look at the importance of ascension. When Jesus ascended to heaven, what does it give us as Christians? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So, uh, the story of Jesus' death can best be explained uh, when we look at the Adam and what he did in the garden. Hallelujah. So, we cannot tell the story of Jesus without examining the story of Adam. Because the two, there is similarities in the two. Uh, the first Adam, the Adam in the creation in Genesis, and then the Bible speaks about the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So we are going to be reading a couple of few scriptures, and uh, quickly I just want us to go into the book of uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, let us see the creation of uh, the first Adam. Hallelujah. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. We are told in this scripture that the the creation of man started out of the dust. So God took the dust and then made man and then he breathed his breath of life and then that breath gave him life and that was the first story of Adam's creation. Hallelujah. So everything starts here. And uh, we are going to look at uh, different other scriptures uh, on how things went and uh, how things unfolded. Amen. But again, when we look at these scriptures, we notice one thing, that Adam was born full grown. Unlike that was the first Adam. Unlike the second Adam. Hallelujah. So Adam found himself in the garden. He was already there, full grown. Mtumzima tayari. Hajapitia process yoyote. Ya utoto, hajapitia process ya kukua. So he was just there. Amen. And um, looking at uh, the second scriptures I want us to look, let us go on the same uh, chapter, uh, verse 15 to 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Amen. Hallelujah. So now, God is telling us, the instructions that he gave to Adam the moment uh, he finished creation. And uh, in this particular verse, two, three verses, we are seeing that uh, God is giving him sort of a law that you shall not eat of this tree, but the rest you will be able to eat. Now, when you look at it, this is the first law that God is giving to man. Amen. And it's not like the laws that Moses gave when he was in the Mount Sinai. This this only law required Adam to obey. Hallelujah. So, uh, Adam is being told, the fruit of the knowledge of evil and good, you shall not eat it. Because there are consequences. But every other thing, you can be able to partake. Amen. And um, when God was giving him instructions, we see that also we note that Eve was not yet in the scene. The woman was not yet in the scene. So God was relating to Adam on a one-to-one basis. As in he was giving him law. He was giving him commandment. He was giving him instructions. Don't do this, but you can do the rest. Hallelujah. Now, Man has been given that responsibilities when it comes to the instructions of God. 
And God can give, when there are two, when God gives the instruction, he will start with the man because he's the head of the house. Amen? And uh, in this aspect, we'll come to look at uh, chapter 3 as we'll read the full chapter. And uh, I want you to take note of some few things. And let us go to chapter 3 first. From verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took off its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cast more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his head. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow, and your conception in pain you shall bring forth children. You desire, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cast is the ground of for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. But thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out of his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim of the, at the east of the garden of Eden and the flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Hallelujah. So there are a lot of things that we can note and we can see from there. And uh, most of these things is... First, we see that the disobedience comes in. When God told Adam in the previous chapter, and then here we see, after Adam being given a helper, uh, Satan, uh, or the serpent as it is referred in the scripture, he says that he was more subtle than any other creature in the, the, uh, the beast that God created. And I know it's a long passage, and uh, when uh, we try to uh, go down one after the other, we will see that uh, God, for the first time, he is instituting punishment. Hallelujah. And uh, in this punishment, first, God is 
condemning Adam, first he started condemning the serpent that uh, convinced Eve to convince Adam. And then now he's de- uh, also condemning Eve. And then he comes to condemn Adam. And all these condemnations are not really pleasant. Now, when God created Adam, he wanted to bask in his glory. And when we look at the, uh, there's a verse that says when God was visiting them in the cool of the day, God wanted to interact with them. Amen? God wanted to, to have a one-on-one communion with Adam, a fellowship, sort of, so that Adam could feel the presence of God. Adam could be in his glory. Hallelujah. And as much as we know that God created uh, man so that he could rule the world, multiply it, that also is one of the objectives. But that most important thing is that the glory of God, the presence of God, Adam could not be denied of it if he was to keep the commandment, if he was to obey the law, if he was to obey the instructions that God gave him. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, when God... Uh, when Adam uh, disobey, we see that God is instituting punishment. And in this punishment, when you look at verse 19, it says, In the sweat of thy face shall you eat bread till you return unto the ground. The statement, till you return to the ground, it means that God for the first time was declaring death. He was condemning Adam to death. Hallelujah. And that was not the original plan. That's why I said in the beginning that we cannot paint a picture of Jesus if we don't look at Adam. And the mistake of one man, we see that it has a replication of all humankind. Because sin entered through one man and death came in to all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are we getting the picture? Are we getting the concept? And... um, The, the, there is this misconception or rather a statement that is really misleading that uh, people normally tend to say that God hates sin but loves sinners. I don't know where people come f- with these statements because it's not biblical. And um, yes, Lord hates sin but he doesn't love sinners. Hallelujah. And um, the book of Isaiah 43, 15, it says that God is holy. Amen. And the creator of Israel and the king, he is holy. Uh, when Jesus met with the uh, woman of Samaritan at the well, he said God is a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit. Hallelujah. And... Um, so many verses when you look, uh, they are speaking about the holiness of God. David in the Psalms, he speaks about the holiness of God. So the holiness of God, it only means that God cannot be associated with any sin. Hallelujah. For the wages of sin is death. That We see that in the book of Romans 6, chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. And um, there is a scripture in First John chapter 3, verse 4. It says, Whosoever commits sin transgress also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So in the justice system of God, there can be punishment if there is no, there cannot be punishment if there is no transgression in the law. And that happens in the, even in the normal uh, worldly systems. If you have not done anything wrong, then you are not against the law. Hallelujah. We agree on that. A typical example I'll tell you. You're, ride, you're driving, and they tell you, if you are supposed to drive, then minimum requirement, you're supposed to be licensed. You're supposed to have a license. If you don't have a license, that means you have provoked the law. You have transgressed the law. So when the uh, police traffic meets you, he can fine you, according to the fine that they have instituted in the offense. Hallelujah. So, um, whosoever commits sin has transgressed 
also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Now, we see the first sin that Adam committed was just a disobedience because God told him, this eat, but these ones you shall not eat. He gave him so much, but only told him, just one, this one, just keep it away. And Adam, he had a free will because during, uh, we see the creation of God, when Adam was uh, placed in the Garden of Eden, he, God provided him with a free will. He could have chosen whether to not disobey God, but he chose the other way around. And even if the woman was the one who was used, Adam had a practical uh, responsibility of making sure what is going on in the house. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, uh, looking at that, now we can be able uh, to look at how death entered the world. Because in chapter 4 of the book of Genesis, we start recording the first death from the face of the earth. Now, Abel falls as the first victim killed by his own brother, Cain. Now, here we start seeing the sting of death affecting the Adam's family. And, the, and, and this re brought a lot of repercussion to Cain. Because God instituted another punishment. Now, in the scripture, one of the scriptures when you read uh, in the, uh, chapter 4, he says that, and Cain departed from the presence of God after, after that incident. Because when God punished him, he, he condemned him. In, I think the condemnation increased from where his father started. For him who was told, you shall till the ground, but the ground will not yield its, f its strength. Now, there are so many doctrines that are going on around at this particular time, speaking about uh, why the ground where we are uh, practicing plantations and all that does not yield. It's because sin entered the world and death was instituted. And even further, the blood that was poured on the ground, it was crying out to God, the, the blood of Abel. Amen? Now, there was a time uh, I remember we bought a land in where we are living currently. And um, someone told me, uh, of course he was a minister. He, he happened to have the presence of God and he told me, you know what, uh, I know you have a plan, uh, you have a land, you have bought land in uh, Goba, but you have to go and pray for it. Because I see in the vision that someone was murdered in the land that you have bought. So we went and prayed. Now, these could be very minor things we can just do away with and say, you know what, we can carry on with life. But you don't know what that blood may be speaking in the future. Amen. Amen. So such a small things, we normally don't tend to take care of them, but uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, repercussions. So we see that Cain was all in this time. God was still with Cain in the family of Adam. So after the death of, uh, after Cain killed his brother, Cain was walked out of the presence of God after, uh, as a punishment. Hallelujah. And um, now we should remember that sin drives out, sin has a repercussion of driving us from the presence of God because it can affect your life, your prayer life, your worship life, and every work of God, even in the ministry. Hallelujah. So sin, it's not really good. And uh, the remedy of sin is Christ. Hallelujah. And um, ever since the devil succeeded in lying to Eve, all he's doing is making sure that because he has that first experience, he feels and is convinced that he can always bring it to you, to your doorstep. So he's constantly trying. And he doesn't have anything new because all he's doing is treacherous lies and making things look like almost. But when you come to reality, that is not it. That's why the Bible says, submit yourselves therefore to God and resist the devil and he will flee. James chapter 4 verse 7. So Satan is always to be resisted. And uh, as a child of God, you can expect that uh, you will always be tempted. 
and you will always come into confrontation with the different lies and treacheries of the devil because the devil is always a liar and uh, the book of John 8 44 he says as you are of your father the devil and the last of your father ye will do he was murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaks a lie he speaks of his own for he's a liar and the father of it amen now remember I said there was a statement that people normally mistakes and they say that God loves, uh, hates sin, but loves sinners. This is not really true. Because in the book of Psalms, we see that, uh, let's look at the Psalms 5, verse 5 to 6. David is saying something about this. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. So, where do we get these stories? Where do we get these lies? And someone says, God helps those who help themselves. It's not scriptural. It doesn't have any base in the scripture. Hallelujah. And uh, such things we have to counter with the word of God. The truth. The Bible says the truth shall set you free. And his word is the truth. The all truth. Amen. That's why in the book of Timothy, Timothy says, uh, Paul is writing to Timothy uh, in the book of uh, chapter Chapter 2 of second book of Timothy, verse 19, he says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal, the Lord knows them that are his, and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Hallelujah. Amen. If you always call the name of Jesus, you know you have a mandate and responsibility to depart from evil. Because you cannot associate the name of Jesus and evil. Hallelujah. Now, in the book of Psalm, verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Hallelujah. So, it does not say that God loves sinners. He says in the book of Psalms that we have just read that uh, God abhors the evil doers. Hallelujah. So, notice that we are instructed by our Lord Jesus to love our enemies and not uh, in the in the aspect of loving sin and hating sinners and all that is saying that we are to love our enemies we are to pray for them that's why the book of luke 6 uh, 27 28 says but i say unto you which hear, love your enemies do good to them which hate you bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you john 3 16 to 17 uh, there's a part that says uh, Jesus did not come to the world to condemn it, but through him that people might be saved. Even Jesus himself, he didn't condemn sinners. Who are we to condemn sinners? Amen? Now, that does not really say that God loves sinners. The fact that Jesus didn't condemn them, it doesn't uh, tell us that uh, God loves sinners. So people just put one scripture and another, they just try to, you know, to mislead you. Now, this is the reality that uh, we are seeing in the Old Testament. Jesus was sent into the world not to condemn the world, but that through him they may have everlasting life. Hallelujah. So now uh, we are going to take a look on other passage of uh, scriptures. Uh, from Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 21. Let's go there quickly. Romans 5, 12 to 21. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. 
but the free gift is not the like is not like the offense for if by the one man's offense many died much more the grace of god and the gift by the grace of the one man jesus christ abounded to many and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification for if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ therefore as through one man's offense ju- judgment came to all men resulting in condemnation even so through one man's righteousness righteous act the free gift came to all men resulting in justification of life for as by one man's op- disobedience many were made sinners so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous moreover the law entered that the offense might abound but where sin abounded grace abounded much more so that as sin reigned in death even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our lord amen this is one of the most important passage in our walk with Christ in our walk with God in our walk as believers amen and uh, if you read it carefully you will note that there are so many words that have been repeatedly the word one by one by one it's been repeatedly almost about 11 times and re- death reigned we see that death has reigned through one but also life came in through one hallelujah and um, in Christ we see obedience righteousness and life but in adam the first adam we see uh, sin condemnation and death so death was instituted because of disobedience but through the obedience again now this is an uh, it's more like a similarity in comparison but this is the similarity of the opposite one man did quite opposite and the other man came to change the narratives hallelujah so the first adam uh reigned in disobedience but also had a repercussions of death sin and condemnation but the second adam reigned in obedience which gave us life and righteousness in god amen so that's why i said we cannot take a look at the life of jesus and the importance of his death without looking at adam because it was through adam that jesus came amen amen Are we now together? Are we getting it? Uh I know my time is far going, but uh, I hope we will be able to finish. Now, Adam single-handedly, it's like the man you give a matchbox and you take him to the kule maeneo ya nani wapi kule mnapoli malima miti. Lilian King kule kwenu njombe kule ndandani. Mafinga eh. Unamweka pale na kiberiti. That's what Adam did in my own <laughs> assertives. Amen. So, it was through his disobedience that death came and because of that everyone that was born after Adam had the same repercussions unless you come to accept Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So, your only remedy or your only uh, medical therapy is for you to accept Jesus Christ. If you come to Christ that's the only thing that is going to do he's going to change your death status and take you to uh, the other status where he gives you life where he gives you righteousness and he gives you peace he gives you joy and everything that God has to give you because God says uh, everything good came from him and during the creation we see that uh, that story tells it uh, quite frankly that and God saw that everything he made was good So everything good is uh it has uh, the character of association with God. Amen. David says in so many uh Psalms that the goodness of God. So uh, we can understand that the goodness of God it gives us life. Hallelujah. So uh during the time from Adam to Moses uh uh from the scriptures that we have read this second passage uh they were not charged with the breaking god's law 
The reason is during that time there was no law and there was no any commandment that God gave them except it was for Adam to obey. Hallelujah. We see the introduction of law when Moses came at the Mount of Sinai when Moses was given a task, a very hard task of taking the people of Israel from Egypt to the land that God preserved for them. Now, that's when in the first instance that God is instituting the laws to the Israelites. Hallelujah. So because there was no, there was no law to break uh, from the time of Adam to Moses, no one was charged with breaking God's law. Hallelujah. But because of that disobedience, we will find our, uh, we found ourselves uh, being subjected to death. Hallelujah. Uh, again, we see that uh, the Adam's disobedience, it costed the whole race of humankind, the whole generation. Now, we, we, we have been able to see this and... Um, Adam is being expressed or explain, uh, explained to be the cause of sin and death, but Christ is the source of grace, and Christ excels Adam by far because grace surpasses sin, and grace all did much better, and it did much more by fixing uh, the damage that Adam caused, and that damage was death. That was are given uh, as a result of disobedience. So the abundance of God's grace echoes a lot through Christ unto us and how we can be able to appropriate that through our belief in Jesus. Hallelujah. And however, uh, the only way we can appropriate this grace is for us to be able to say that Christ died so that we could be partaking the life that he brought because uh, from the mathematical equation, Christ came to substitute our death. Because he died in our place. Hallelujah. Now, he died in our place so that he could give us the life that God uh, didn't provide in the first place. Amen? Amen? So, that's how important the death of Christ in our lives. In the book of John 3, 14, 15, uh, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. God's grace triumphs over many transgressions. Not just one, because he provides a substitute, a righteousness for us in Christ. Hallelujah. So in Jesus accepting the responsibility, the task that he was given, that provided us with so much uh, righteousness in our lives. He's, he provided us so much grace. So uh, that's why it says, even as sin abounded, grace abounded even more. Because when God looks at you, he's looking at the finished work of what his son did. And he's, when he's looking at you, and you have already made up your mind, you have believed, and you have accepted Christ, he doesn't look at you with your sinful nature. He looks at the finished work of the cross. Hallelujah. So Jesus... He came to substitute that which was not for him, but it was for us. Death was our showcase. Amen? Death was the condemnation we received through Adam. And everyone that comes after Adam, unless he submits to the, uh, to the leadership of Christ, death will always be the fate. Hallelujah. And this is why we need to go out and bring this reality to the people outside. Because this year, our theme is evangelism. And being that our theme, we have to make sure that these people know the reality. This is one of the best reality we can tell them. Because outside Christ, death will always prevail. Now, there is a first death and then the second death. The first death is when pe your loved ones, they say bye. And that's the end of it. 
but the second death is the last day. Now, through Christ, we are sure of all the death. Amen. I mean, the first death will not give us any challenge because it's only the transition into glory. Amen. Now, we have to make sure that we tell people that this is what Jesus came to do. This is the most important thing about the death of Christ. Hallelujah. Do we get the point? Do we get the gospel? Are we able to understand and take the gospel to the people outside? Amen. Amen. Praise God. And Paul, uh, in this passage of the scripture, is mentioning that the law only reveals sin. Christ and grace brings righteousness leading to eternal life. Because the law came in so that transgression may increase. But where the power of sin increased, as seen in the post-Sinai life, God's grace multiplied even more. Hallelujah. So God forgave Israel and made them to join him and always made sure that these people are not far away from me. That's why first he provided them with the laws. Amen. But just to make sure that at least they are worshipping him. But even though when he provided them with the law, sin abounded much further. Now, grace is introduced in the area where now Jesus comes in. Now, when Jesus comes in, he introduced the subject of grace. Now, grace, even when sin prevailed, grace of God abounded even more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this is the reality of Jesus' death and this is the reality that we need to take to the people. Tell them that the wages of sin is death. But you don't have to go through death. You have to accept Christ. Hallelujah. You have to understand that the work of Christ that he did on the cross, it's more important uh, to make us the way we are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So uh, the first Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22 it says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. There's a, there's a, there's a scripture in Romans 6 15. Uh, it's speaking about uh, being subject or being slaves to someone. Uh, let's let's look at that chapter 16 uh, uh, Romans chapter 6 verse 16 do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey you are that one slaves whom you obey whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness amen if you constantly uh, yield to a sinful nature you become a slave to sin. Amen? Now, if you obey the word of God, resist the devil, change your nature, change your sinful nature, you appropriate the grace of God. Because in our own strength, we cannot. But with the strength of God that is packed in grace, where Jesus provides, when you look at the grace, when you look at the cross and you look at the grace of God that has provided, that's the only way you can win. That's the only way you can be able to have strength in your weakness. That's why Jesus was telling Paul, my grace is sufficient. Hallelujah. So let us rely on the grace of God and let us take the gospel telling that even though you are living in a sinful nature and you think you cannot be able to live the Christian life, it is not in you to do it, but it is the grace of God that takes you there. The grace of God that gives you power. The grace of God that enables you. It is not by your strength. That's why Zachariah says it's not by strength, it's not by might, but my spirit, says the Lord. The moment you appropriate that grace, God gives you the strength through his spirit. Because God gives you strength through the spirit of God. And that spirit of God will be able to change your life. That spirit of God is going to empower you. That spirit of God is going to give you energy. The spirit of God is going to give you victory in the areas that you never thought that you could. In your own sinful nature, the body, the flesh 
cannot achieve anything. That's why the flesh is in constantly war with the spirit. Amen. Amen. Now this is the gospel that we need to take to the rest of the world. Hallelujah. Amen. So Christ died for the ungodly, everyone included, and sinners, you and me, wicked, everyone. But the death which we were legally condemned, that was our portion. He died in our place that we may be declared righteous. Simply means Christ took our place and solved the judgment of sin, condemnation, and death puzzle. Jesus, actual death, which was our legal punishment, it was translated as from death to life. Hallelujah. So that's how important the death of Jesus in our lives. That's how crucial the death of Jesus in our lives. By Jesus' death on the cross, we who belong to Adam's race are justified and reconciled to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Maybe you are here and uh, you're saying, I have listened to the voice of the Spirit speaking to me. I have listened to the gospel. And I need to come to Christ so that I can transcend my life from death and appropriate the grace of God that gives me life and eternal life, that gives me grace to prevail in the Christian walk, that gives me power to live and do away with the sinful nature. And you're here and you want to give your life to Christ. Just raise your hand so that we can pray for you. The grace is available and God is able and willing. He is always happy to see one turns to him. One that is turning from his wickedness. God is happy. If you are here, all right, let us bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful word that has ministered unto us. Lord, we thank you because you hear us, our Father. Thank you because your son's death has given us so much life. Your son's death is so important in our lives, oh Father. Father, we thank you for the victory that you have given us through the cross. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your grace that is still abounding in our lives to change and take us from one glory to another. The grace that sanctifies our life to be able uh, to, to come conform to your image almighty father father we give you all the grace we give you all the glory we thank you almighty god in the mighty name of jesus we pray uh even uh for this word oh god that even as we take this word to to the people oh lord to those that, oh Lord, you are looking unto them to change them, oh Lord. We pray that this reality may be true in their lives by the Spirit of God. In Jesus' mighty name, we give you all thanks and honor and glory. Amen.